Welcome back to the last video from chapter 15, although this is not the last video about our star, the Sun. We're going to be talking about space weather very briefly, which is the way that the Sun actively affects the Earth. So space weather is a general term for events that can directly affect the Earth that are caused by the sun's activity. We discussed some of the terms in the previous video, uh, including coronal mass ejections, solar flares, and the solar wind. And so we're going to make sure that we understand how those actively affect the Earth. So as a reminder, coronal mass ejections are physical masses of plasma that used to be at the sun and that are sent out into space. Now keep in mind that space is a large, uh, a large area, and if they're sent in any direction that isn't towards the Earth, then we're okay, but sometimes they are sent in our direction. Solar flares are high-energy photons. They are light, and sometimes that um, light is able to affect usually satellites um, and, and other things outside of Earth's uh, atmosphere. And then the solar wind is particles, so electrons and protons that also would normally be part of coronal mass ejections, but the solar wind is much lower density than CMEs and it is more consistent and constant than CMEs are. So the solar wind comes from coronal holes and is very fast moving but very low density material. Now, to make sure that we understand what we are talking about when we talk about coronal mass ejections, the sun doesn't just choose to send a um, rooted bit of the plasma from the chromosphere or corona. What's normally happening is there is a big loop of material that is following along magnetic field lines that if those magnetic field lines change at the base of that big loop, then maybe that entire loop of material is then sent out into space, and that's what tends to happen. So here's an example sequence of a coronal mass ejection, and the video that's linked here will also be in the YouTube playlist um, right after this. But in example A, we are looking at visible light, and so we are looking at the sun's photosphere, the so-called surface of the sun, where those darker areas are sunspots. In example B, we are looking at X-ray information about the sun, where in the same areas where we see sunspots, we are seeing in the corona active regions. Now, if you look at the central active region in that part B picture, you see that there's kind of these weird lines across that um, really bright active region. That's because a solar flare happened that was such high energy and so bright in the X-rays that it saturated those parts of the picture. In part C and D, in both of those remaining pictures, we are looking at what's called a coronagraph. It is a device that takes pictures in regular visible light, but has blocked the disk of the sun, basically creating a fake solar eclipse so that we're able to see large loops of material like the bottom of the picture in C and D that is being sent outwards. Now, because we're seeing it come out of the bottom of the picture, that means it's not heading towards Earth in this particular example, but it's worth keeping in mind that sometimes this does get directed towards us. So when we have material coming from the sun to the Earth, often with coronal mass ejections, but sometimes with really high um, speed bursts of the solar wind, then electrons can be trapped by Earth's magnetic field. They follow along the field lines to where those field lines connect in the atmosphere near the north and south poles of the Earth. When that happens, we get beautiful aurora, like that shown here. But it is worth recognizing that although aurora are very pretty, they are the kind of warning sign for us that something else could be happening in the realm of space weather. So when energetic electrons hit our atmosphere, they cause the molecules in our atmosphere to glow. 
Not quite in the same way that we talked about in chapter five, but in very related ways. The molecules were excited, and when they drop back down to a more neutral state, um, they release photons, light. And in this particular picture, we can see that towards the bottom of what we're looking at, there's like a bluish greenish glow. And towards the top of what we're looking at, there's kind of a pinkish reddish glow. The color is based on the specific molecules that are being excited. One thing that a lot of students don't necessarily think about, and there's not really a reason why we would have in our everyday lives, is we hear sometimes about the northern lights, but we might not have ever thought about the fact that there is also the southern lights. The picture shown here is actually showing us the southern hemisphere, the aurora australis, instead of the northern hemisphere, the aurora borealis. It is the same overall structure. Both poles have very similar amounts of aurora that they see. It's just that in the northern hemisphere, we tend not to think about um, the other part of the Earth as much as we maybe should. Now, it is important, though, that we recognize that space weather is not just aurora, these pretty dancing lights in the sky. Instead, there can be more significant dangers caused by the sun. So our case study example to think about this is in 1859, Richard Carrington, who was an, English, uh, an Englishman who on his own time, he practiced astronomy. And one of the things he did was he was one of the many people who contributed to our sunspot record. He was doing his normal uh, daily observations of the sun. And when he was looking at the sunspot group shown here, he actually saw some bright flashes of light. He noted it and thought it was kind of strange. And it is important for us to recognize now in the 21st century that what he had been seeing was a solar flare that was so high energy that rather than being confined just to x-rays or ultraviolet light, it made so much energy in such a wide distribution that it was able to make visible light that Carrington saw. And so he took note of it, but didn't think much of it otherwise. But a couple of days after that observation, there were aurora at much lower latitudes than had normally been seen, and telegraph lines, the primary mode of communication at this point in time, they were overloaded by electricity and they stopped working. There were actually several fires that started in telegraph um, offices. These effects lasted for days. Now, all of this seems to be kind of a weird disconnected set of effects, but what we now understand is that what Richard Carrington saw was solar flares associated with a very large amount of material, a coronal mass ejection that was also released from the same active region heading directly towards the Earth. And when this coronal mass ejection interacted with Earth's magnetic field, it basically peeled back the layers of Earth's protective blanket, kind of like an onion, and was able to create aurora at much lower latitudes because it has, had gone through so much of this protection. Now, if this same event were to happen now in the 21st century, what we would end up with was electricity running through any large, long metal wires, because a changing magnetic field, when the sun changes the Earth's magnetic field, any changing magnetic field creates an electric field. And so that's why the telegraph lines were overloaded. And thinking about the 21st century, what that would mean is um, all of our power grid would be overloaded by electricity. We could destroy a large number of transformers for which there is no warehouse of backup transformers currently available. And so we might be out of power for years. This would put us back a significant amount. And in general, space weather can affect power grids and has in the past and currently. It can also affect oil pipelines. If we think about oil pipes as long metal um, objects, there can be electric field that degrades oil pipelines because of the sun's effect, things we don't normally think about. 
Now, it's worth recognizing that we work really hard as a society to be prepared for something like this. But even with an active Space Weather Prediction Center, which is part of our um, full weather service, it's part of NOAA, we are not actually at the scientific understanding to be able to look at the sun's magnetic field and know that it is going to send off a coronal mass ejection. What we can currently do is look at any flare or coronal mass ejection and recognize how long it should take and predict when it will get to Earth and how we will be affected. And although this doesn't seem like much, consider in a lightning storm, you know that in a really bad lightning storm, maybe you unplug stuff from the wall so that you um, don't have any surges that ruin your equipment. We can do similar kinds of things. We can ground planes if we know something is going to be really bad with space weather. We can take transformers off the grid, putting people into a temporary blackout if we know that there is going to be a major problem. And we can mitigate the effects of a space weather um, event, a, a problematic storm like the Carrington event of 1859. So it is something that is worth recognizing that the sun has a direct effect on Earth. Like this entire video is par partially for our curriculum and partially for our understanding as members of a society that this is a really important thing for someone to be able to be working on. And we have the Space Weather Prediction Center to be able to help us prepare for something like this. So this is the actual end of chapter 15. In this entire chapter, we have thought about the sun as the thing next door, part of our system that we live in. Chapter 16 is going to take a look at the sun with a slightly more abstracted view, looking at the sun as an example star rather than the thing that directly affects our lives here on Earth. So I am excited to join you for that next chapter, and I will see you in the next video.